Welcome everyone, I'm Grace Korea Kanja and this is Africa Matters. Now the world is becoming more African. In fact, the United Nations predicts that in less than 30 years from now, one in four people on the planet will be from the continent. So the US elections on November 5th will be closely watched to see how they are likely to affect this burdening region and shape foreign policy. Now, the United States appears to be losing influence on the African continent in recent years. Many African countries have been turning to China and Russia for trade and investments. But the U.S. is trying to reconnect using a different approach. Isaac Kaleji reports on how the U.S. is now prioritizing key investments that target Africa's young population. These young Ghanaians are taking computer lessons at this digital lab in Choco, a deprived community in the capital Accra. Some of them are using and learning about computers for the first time, building their digital literacy skills from scratch. The lab is an initiative of an American social entrepreneur, Patricia Wilkins. We launched a program just a few months ago, and we've already had one cohort of students, and we've graduated 25 students with their first certificates in hardware and networking. Currently, we're running our second cohort, and we have almost 100 students, and we have three classes. American digital communications technology firm Cisco is sponsoring this lab. Expanding digital access and literacy in Africa has been a key U.S. initiative since 2022. It has led to increased commercial engagement between African and American companies in the digital sector. With a growing younger population in Africa, the U.S. wants to invest in the continent's youth while striking an equal partnership with shared interests. America's influence in Africa was substantial in the past, from funding major infrastructure projects, providing security support, and rolling out major trade deals. But a lot has changed. Analysts say that's due to the emergence of China and Russia. Uh, Africa has not been a major priority of the United States in the past two decades, in that what we call the Asian pivot, where they see they wanted to counter the influence of China in Asia, made Africa a back burner. Uh, they, they put Africa in the back burner. But recently, because of issues including the population growth that comes with markets, um, resources, and the, the, the sheer influence that China is exerting in Africa, U.S. wants to counter that. But the U.S. has lost a lot of ground to China. The Asian giant is now a major creditor and trading partner to most African countries, funding major infrastructure projects like this fishing harbor in Accra. In the past two decades, the International Monetary Fund says China has become sub-Saharan Africa's largest bilateral trading partner. Around 20% of the region's exports now go to China, and about 16% of Africa's imports come from China. Russia is also pushing harder, especially in the Sahel region. Some analysts believe African countries need to combine their interests to get the best deals. And projects like this one in Accra may just be what the U.S. needs to rekindle its influence once more. Isaac Kaleji, Africa Matters, Accra, Ghana. And U.S. President Joe Biden promised not only win-win partnerships, but to be all in on Africa's future. However, some analysts argue that the U.S. is not prioritizing the continent in its foreign policy now. Washington has traditionally advocated for democracy, human rights, and security. So let's take a look back at some of the major U.S. policies that have shaped the African continent in the last two decades. In 2000, the Democrat President Bill Clinton signed the African Growth and Opportunity Act, or AGOA, which offers duty-free access to the U.S. market for certain products from eligible sub-Saharan African countries. Countries like Niger, Gabon, and Uganda have been expelled from AGOA for what the U.S. cites as gross violation of human rights or failure to promote democracy. But it's set to expire next year, and its renewal is under threat if America continues to adopt the America First trade policy. 
Also under threat is the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, a health policy launched in 2003 by Republican President George W. Bush. Now PEPFAR reports its mission to end the HIV AIDS pandemic as a public health threat by 2030 has saved more than 25 million lives by providing HIV prevention and treatment services. But President Joe Biden's administration cut funding by more than 6% in next year's budget. The Bush administration also launched the United States Africa Command in 2007 as part of a broader fight against terror groups like Al-Qaeda and Daesh after the U.S. attacks on September 11th in 2011. Washington has at least 26 military bases on the continent, but the future of its counterterrorism efforts in some places like Niger is uncertain after the junta closed its bases there and turned to Russia as an alternative security partner. In 2013, President Barack Obama launched the Power Africa initiative to try to double access to electricity across sub-Saharan Africa from renewable sources. Obama emphasized trade, not aid, to the continent, but his military intervention in Libya has been criticized for leaving the country unstable. In 2018, Republican President Donald Trump launched the Prosper Africa Initiative to expand U.S.-Africa trade and investment while countering what it has described as predatory Russian and Chinese influence in the region. That's about the time when the Kremlin became the continent's largest weapon supplier, while China had already surpassed the U.S. to become Africa's largest trading partner in 2019. The outgoing Democratic President Joe Biden pledged to invest 55 billion U.S. dollars in the continent over a three-year period, which would include climate adaptation and post-COVID-19 pandemic economic recovery. He also promised to visit the continent, but that hasn't happened yet. All right, let's hear more from Professor H. S. Sikanku. He's an associate professor of journalism and international communication, University of Media Arts and Communication Institute of Journalism. He joins me from Accra, Ghana. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Right. So I want to start by talking about the two candidates, Donald Trump and, of course, Kamala Harris. So is either of the two likely to shift the U.S. foreign policy towards Africa? And if so, in what ways? Uh, thank you very much. Fundamentally, U.S. policy towards Africa um, would not shift dramatically. It would follow a general um, U.S. template over the years, um, which is to say that Africa does not often feature prominently in U.S. presidential elections or in the campaigns. Uh, however, once they do get elected and based on their disposition and their ideological positions or standpoints, uh, their relationship with Africa is likely to be different. So, for instance, if we have uh, Kamala Harris, a Democrat, getting into office, the traditional line of the Democratic ideology has been quite international, quite cooperative. Uh, they have a globalist um, outlook, an internationalist outlook. And so you can be sure that a uh, candidate or a president, Kamala Harris, is likely to be somebody who would extend a hand to Africa in terms of a multilateral or internationalist um, framework. Uh, somebody like Donald Trump is more isolationist and is more nativist, or as, and as some people say, is more inward-looking in terms of his political ideology. Uh, in fact, the centerpiece of his ideological standpoint, as far as domestic and internationalism is concerned, is the America First principle, which says that the U.S. or local or domestic issues should take predominance over anything else. We've seen a Donald Trump who has been very, very reluctant uh, to participate in uh, climate court ag agreements or climate deals. We've seen uh, Donald Trump, uh, who never visited Africa when he was president. We've seen a uh, Donald Trump who has used very derogatory terms to refer to Africa over the past. And so he really operates based on a, a neo-colonialist mindset where Africa is, is seen as a dark, gaping um, hole made up of... Uh, uh, people married in, in conflict and poverty and uh, viewed within frames of derogation, I mean, frames uh, that uh, point to a continent that is marginalized and very derogatory terms used against the continent. And so that is the framework within which uh, both of them are going to appeal just in terms of the political, ideological um, outlook or standpoint. But beyond that, 
We can also say that Kamala Harris is human rights centered. Uh, Donald Trump is more um, uh, in terms of more domesticate um, his his nativist in orientation. And so you can expect that Kamala might uh, be concerned about human rights issues in Africa, uh, while Donald Trump is is more likely uh, to to teeter towards countries like Russia or sometimes dictatorial regimes, as we've seen in his past or his previous term in office. Right. But then, you know, we are able to sort of like judge Donald Trump because of his track record as he has served as president. But we are yet to see what a Kamala Harris presidency would look like, though we've seen how she operates, especially under Biden. And granted, she has made three trips to African countries. But then um, the question would be, Donald Trump himself has had the Prosper Africa initiative. Do you think he would continue with such initiatives or, or strategies to the continent if he won, if he becomes the next president? Yes, um, you're right. Uh, one of the major things that Donald Trump did was a Prosper Africa initiative to support U.S. investors and a, a, a growing middle class in Africa. Uh, but that has also been centered on uh, the idea of competing with Chinese influence over here. He has not said anything uh, that points to the fact that uh, there will be a discontinuation of it. Uh, but what we do know is that Africa has not definitely featured prominently. We also do know that um, in terms of his position on certain things such as abortion, that is also going to affect the relationship uh, with Africa, probably reneging on deals or agreements uh, that have family planning, um, that have family planning initiatives in them. His, uh, the Republican Party generally is not big on that, uh, and so we can expect that 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 would one thing that would influence his relationship uh, with the continent. Um, but when it comes to um, Donald Trump, he's a bit transactional in terms of his relationship uh, um, with Africa and in terms of his governance approach. So. The first question that he probably would be asking would be, what is in it for America? That might dominate uh, the kind of relationship that he has towards Africa. Uh, you know, you asked about Trump. On the other hand, you said Kamala Harris has not been in government. But we do know enough about her position. I mean, her work as vice president. We do know enough about her from an, I, I, from, from an ideological standpoint of view and also from her partisan viewpoint. Uh, this was the party, the Democratic Party, that brought in the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA. Right. And that policy has been continued by a lot of U.S. Uh, governments, irrespective of the political party. And so um, it is expected that they will maintain that policy. We also expect to see a, a Kamala Harris who will be interested more in um, philanthropic um, uh, initiatives in Africa. Right. I want us to come back to what you mentioned in the beginning there. You talked about China and Russia and the influence that it has on uh, Africa and sort of like how it's become a threat to the U.S. hegemony on the continent. But then how can African leaders capitalize on this? Because everybody wants a share of Africa. Everybody is competing for Africa, China, Russia, the United States. So how can African leaders capitalize this? Uh, well, I, I, I do think that this would be a very good opportunity for African governments, African presidents, um, to be able to make better negotiations, to make better deals. Um, it would be a good chance to also put Africa or African interests at the forefront of any sort of bilateral or multilateral um, agreements that, that are had. It's very important that even within the continent, when you look at the foreign policy initiatives, when you look at their international plans and their international policies, it's very important and critical that African leaders themselves go to that bilateral and multilateral table with policies, with initiatives that will stand to the benefit of the people of the continent in and of itself. It is important not to just think about what is going to be beneficial to the leaders or to the political leadership or hegemony itself. But when we talk about those negotiations or those deals with China, for instance, the mining of natural resources, some of the conditions under which the loans or the trade deals are given, the question is, 
has Africa looked out for itself? Mm -hmm. And that is the next step where our leaders should begin to make sure that they prioritize the needs and the future of the continent when they get into such bilateral and multi-relationships with countries such as the United States. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Eche Sikanku. There. Thank you so much for your time and contribution. Thank you very much.